Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. So today I'm going to be showing you how I make my pewter jewelry, specifically this moonbow amulet, which is annoyingly out of frame. I planned that well. If you guys haven't already, you should definitely check out my Etsy. I have a wide range of pewter jewelry on there, which will actually show you sort of what you can do with it. Pewter is a good starter metal for jewellery making because it has such a low melting point that you can actually melt it with a solder pot. From memory, the melting point is around 200 degrees Celsius. But not only that, it's a pretty sturdy metal and it does kind of look a little bit like silver. But like if that silver was sitting in an abandoned house for like a couple of decades. Now this particular amulet I actually made for a D&D &D cosplay, which sort of gives you some ideas that, of what you can do with this technique. My current character, Valra Sinaldi, is a moon elf that was raised by a drow. She has no idea of her past, and her only connection to it is a necklace that has an amulet on it that is a moon surrounded by a bow. No prizes for guessing which god this is about. <laughs> But I really like the design of this amulet as well because it kind of reminds me of Artemis and I love Artemis. So it's like a double whammy for this particular amulet. Now anyway, before this intro gets any longer, let's just jump into how I made this. Well guys, first off we're going to be modeling this in Blender. And to make this easier on myself, I'm going to be trying to utilize the shapes that Blender already has. So for this, I used a spear, flattened it, copied this, and made it slightly bigger for the ring. I'm also going to be using the Boolean modifier to cut the larger ring in half to get the moonbow shape. From here, I can adjust the sizes a little bit and get into making the moon actually look like a moon. To do this, I will be in sculpting mode. I will remesh the shape so that I can actually make some smooth shapes. And I will just be removing a bit of clay, trying to get the crevices of the moon into the, one of the faces. I'm also going to remesh the outer circle just to make it nice and smooth. I was considering putting some patterns on it, but in the end I liked it plain. So once I'm happy with the overall shape, I'm going to add a cylinder and again use the boolean modifier to add a little hole in the object so that I can actually put a jump ring through to make it a necklace. And once I'm happy with that, our shape is all ready to go. So now we need to get it into a format that the resin printer will understand, and to do this I'm going to be using ChuChuBox. Now you don't have to model your shape in Blender or in any other 3D printing software and 3D print it. You can also make it out of clay or wood or any sort of material that you're most comfortable with carving or shaping. But I just prefer using Blender and 3D printing it in resin. So here I'm just making sure the supports are where I want them so that we're not going to have any failures when we print this particular model. The automatic supports are pretty good, but I tend to add way more just in case. And here's how it looks when it's been 3D printed in resin. Uh, sorry that I'm using tools to show you this and I'm trying not to touch it with my hands. I ran out of gloves, so I had to improvise. I feel like I could have done better if I'd used chopsticks or something to hold it, but I got there in the end. So now we need to get the excess resin off the piece. Usually there's some liquid stuff on there that you do not want to cure on your piece. So to do this, I usually use methylated spirits, but there are much better alternatives. This is just the most easiest thing for me to get. And once the bath is done, I tend to put it outside to full UV cure. You can also use UV lights, but here in Australia, the UV index is pretty high, so this is good enough for me. Uh, 
And now it's time to make a mold for this piece. Uh, I tried to put it in a box to reduce the amount of silicon I was using, um, but I just couldn't get it to stand up properly. So in the end, I ended up using this 3D printed filament little mold piece thing um, that I got off Thingiverse. There are heaps of these online and they're really good for making molds. Now I'm just hot gluing the piece on top and the part that it's actually glued to is going to act as our sprue for this mold. The spew is essentially where you're going to pour whatever medium you're making this mold for, whether it be resin or pewter. You want to have your sprue in a position where it's in a place on your object that it's not going to mess it up when you finally cut the sprue off. For me, I didn't really have a lot of choice with this. So now I'm just going to hot glue this to the bottom of a cup and this is going to act as my container to pour the silicon in. The reason I'm gluing it down is so it doesn't move around in the cup. Now for making a silicon mold for pewter, you're going to need to find a silicon that has very high heat resistance and it's specifically made for this. Your run of the mill silicon that you use for resin and other things like that just won't work. This particular silicon I bought from Aldax, I'll put a link in the description below. It's called M4670 High Temperature RTV Silicon Rubber. And it seems to work really well for the job. Now this is a two part silicon that is measured by weight. So I'm just using the scales here. Make sure you use different spoons when you're going between the different parts. And now it's time to do part two. This is a one to 10 ratio for this particular silicon. And now you need to mix the two parts together until it feels like your arm's falling off and then go for an extra five minutes on top of that. Because the silicon is kind of the same color, it's really hard to judge when it's done. So you just need to keep mixing and make sure. Now one thing to note with resin printed objects is sometimes certain silicons will not cure with them. So my work around this is I use a light coating of like a gloss spray paint. This seems to do the trick for me. There are much better products out there. Uh, one of them that comes to mind is Inhibit X. This is a really good product, but it's super expensive and hard for me to get here. So I tend to just go with the gloss paint but it doesn't always work. So you need to be aware that if you are trying to use this, you may need to make your silicon mold again, which can be costly and time consuming. So just be aware of that. For this particular mold, I did have a certain area that didn't cure, but I don't believe this is because of the resin. It was in a spot that I think it was just, there was a bit of the silicon that wasn't mixed properly together. And that's why it was still a bit sticky, but it actually still does the job fine for what I needed to do. Now I would highly recommend marking out on the base of that plastic piece which way you should cut because I didn't and I had no idea so I cut this a billion times. Uh, just to note when you are cutting it you want to cut in zigzag so that you have little registration marks so that your mold goes together properly. Now as you can see here there is about four different cuts. Now this made a couple of problems. Uh, there were a couple of seam lines on the actual face of the piece. I ended up kind of liking them, but usually I wouldn't. So make sure that you actually mark which way you want to cut your piece out so that you can actually cut along the edges and it won't be seen. But yes, this was a very, very messy mold. <laughs> So 
So here I'm just cutting out some air vents. I'm sorry that's hard to see, but basically what you want to do is there's any points where air could get trapped. Uh, you want to cut out a tiny slit, not big enough for pewter to get out, but enough for air to escape. So any points, anything that's pointing upwards that could be an air pocket, you want to cut a slit into that. But when you're done with the mold, it's time to melt the pewter. So I'm just using a soldering pot to melt this. Now we've got safety inspector Greg here to remind you that this is very dangerous. You do not want to get molten metal on your skin or anything at all because it will burn and it will end you up in hospital. So make sure you're wearing safety glasses, make sure you're in a well ventilated area or you've got some sort of uh, respiratory protection on and make sure you're wearing gloves and long sleeve things. Any sort of thick jackets is usually what I tend to wear for this and it seems to do the job, but make sure you're being super careful. Also make sure you're doing it on a heat protected surface. I'm just using this mat and as you can see from the burn marks, I make a mess a lot. See how it spills out of the sides there? Yeah, you will make a mess. Don't do this on wood. But now enough of the safety induction I want to actually talk about this pouring so once it poured you want to wait for it to harden and as you can see right here see how those little bubbles down the bottom change color you might want to rewind and have a look at this it'll actually go to like a frosted color and that's how you know that it's solidified now you definitely do not want to take your gloves off during this at all it is very very hot make sure you've got some fixed gloves now, I also find that the first pour never works. I think the molds actually need to heat up. You'll find that there's a lot of little bubbles and weird stuff going on. It's not a very nice finish. So I'll just show you that up close now. See how it's all, yeah, nah, it's not good, not good. So we're gonna put this back in the pot and remelt it. This is a really good thing about pewter is if something messes up, you can just remelt it again. Now this time I learnt from my previous mistake, I'm going to put some other silicone moulds underneath it to protect the mat and I'm going to be using a clamp to hold it together. Now here I'm just scraping the surface of the pewter, you'll end up with some weird gunk up the top there that you don't want going into your mould. Also another mistake I made, you do not want to shake the pewter while it's curing. You'll find that it doesn't cure as hard, it'll be really crumbly and that's just not what you want. So don't move your pewter while it's hardening. But let me just show you this one anyway. So as I open it up, you'll see that the spew kind of crumbles. Yeah, you don't want that. So don't move your pewter while it's solidifying. Now this one didn't really work either. The finish wasn't great. And that's when I remembered that I forgot to use talcum powder in my moulds. Now, when you're casting pewter in silicon moulds, you actually want to put a layer of talcum powder down. I'm not entirely sure what this does, but it seems to help the pewter actually get into all the little cracks. And it just makes this finish a lot smoother. So this is what I'm doing now. You can see I've sprinkled some in there. I'm going to put the moulds together and sort of tap them around to make sure that the the powder actually gets everywhere I need it to. And once I'm done with this, I'm just going to tap the excess out. You can actually reuse this for a fair few poles before you need to redo it. So let me show you one that actually worked. I was really happy with this particular piece. And now that that's cured, we're going to take the clamps off. And this one actually stays in the mold so I can sort of show you how it looks. Now see, very hot, see that? Very hot. But this is how it actually looks when it's been cast properly. Now 
This one was actually a little hard to get out, but I'm just going to pop that out there. And that's all good to go. That is cool enough to put on the table surface. Now I'm going to speed this process up a bit, but I make a couple more as well. You'll find that not every single one works, and you'll soon get the habit of what works and what doesn't, so that you can actually get a really high rate of return. So now we need to take the sprues off. I find that using some scissors or a saw to make a first indent and then using some pliers to wiggle it off seems to do the trick. I am also using some sharp scissors to cut the uh, little edges off to make it a bit smoother. Um, there are definitely other tools you can use. I can just find for smaller objects, scissors seem to work fine. But now we need to polish these up a little bit. Um, you can see the seam line then I was talking about from the mold. We'll get back to this in a little while because I end up using an electric sander to do a better job. But now we need to actually make the necklace. So to do this I've picked up some arts and crafts from uh, Linkcraft. This particular stuff is uh, a jump ring and some metal chain. Uh, it's all some sort of um, mixed metal alloy. This stuff is relatively cheap but you can definitely buy some more expensive silver chain if you'd like. So I've just opened up this split ring and I'm going to try to put it through the piece very unsuccessfully. That was actually taken a couple of minutes later, sorry. And I'm just going to push it back together and now we have a little hoop to put our chain through. Now a lot of this is off camera, I'm really sorry I couldn't keep it in the frame. But I am going to add a jump ring to the end of this particular chain and then add a lobster clasp to it. And once I've done that, I'm going to thread it through the amulet. And once that's done, I'm going to add another jump ring split ring uh, to the end to finish off the chain. Now you can make the chain as long or as short as you'd like. Uh, I tend to stick to fairly standard lengths. Um, I made this in a 45 but didn't like it so I ended up going to a 50 centimeter chain. And there we go, that's basically done. So let me quickly show you what it looks like. Um, I do a little bit of cleanup on it later but this is just the stage it was at here. So that there is the 50 centimeter length chain and here it is up close. So now I'm going to do a little bit of a reenactment for you. I didn't film this because I wasn't sure how it was going to go but I end up using uh, this belt sander to sand an edge on these. I think it looks really pretty. It sort of looks like the um, the moon bow is radiating out and I'm sort of using a movement uh, similar to if you were sharpening a blade. Now don't worry this is actually not sharp, I blended the ends and this is how it looks. Well guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope this video helped you learn a new skill and maybe gave you some inspiration for upcoming cosplays or projects. And I really hope you give it a try. It's really fun. It's kind of easy to get into and look at the stuff you can make. But anyway, that's really all I have to say. So thank you so much and I will see you guys next Friday. Bye. This feels really awkward. I'm trying to avoid the microphone. Bye.